Welcome back to Paul's Tech News. Those who watch my show on a weekly basis have come to expect a certain level of quality and attention to detail in the production and execution of this series, even though it's essentially a glorified oversimplification of a handful of recent tech stories I thought I could make a few off-color jokes about. And while today's installment certainly includes all of that, we've got Intel Alder Lake X high-end desktop CPUs, B650 motherboards for the upcoming Zen 4-based Ryzen 7000 series, and Nvidia is now dabbling in erectile dysfunction supplements, but it also contains continues a legacy of tech news greatness, making good on my solemn vow to diligently and consistently perform this job that has been handed down to myself by myself every week for like a really long time now. And while you're probably thinking, Paul, who doesn't give themselves a weekly hand job these days? I mean, at least you've got to relieve the tension somehow. The point I'm trying to make is that when I do all of these things, I'm thinking of you. Excellent. Today's video is brought to you by the Height Y60, a striking and versatile ATX case with a three-piece wraparound tempered glass side panel that provides a breathtaking view of your PC's inner workings. The exclusively vertical GPU mount includes a PCIe Gen 4 riser cable and still allows for additional half-height expansion cards, and vented panels throughout the chassis allow for airflow while adding an aesthetic finishing touch. The Height Y60 includes three Flow FE 120mm fans and is available in black, white, or red. Click the sponsor link in the description for more. We begin this week with Thursday's review embargo lift for AMD's long-anticipated new fastest CPU for gaming, the $450 8-core Ryzen 5800X 3D, which has been overall well-received by reviewers who found it to be about 15-20% to 20 faster in gaming than a regular 5800X or even a 5900X, while also, generally speaking, keeping up with and sometimes outperforming Intel's 12900K, depending on variables like whether that CPU was paired with DDR4 or DDR5 memory, the speed of the DDR5, whether or not it was the 12900K or the more recently launched 12900KS with its 1 to 200 megahertz clock speed increase, and of course what games were sampled. The verdict might change based on your perspective and CPU needs, however. If gaming is your primary focus, and particularly if you're already running one of the many AM4 motherboards that can be updated to support the new chip, you might find it a solid upgrade that can squeeze more frames out of your GPU compared to earlier Ryzen offerings. Efficiency numbers look good too, but value is less of a selling point. It might seem like a good gaming CPU for $450 when you compare it to a $600-ish 12900K, or especially the stupidly priced $800 12900KS, but realistically the configurations used to show performance differences in gaming CPUs, which tend to focus on lower resolutions like 1080 or even 720p, while pairing the processor with a GPU like a 3090Ti that costs four times as much, are not especially realistic, so don't go convincing yourself to drop the extra cash on a 5800X 3D when you're pairing it with an RTX 3060 or 3070, because chances are it will not make a difference and you could have just opted for a 5600X or an Intel 12400 instead. And credit to Hardware Canucks and Dimitri for including some benchmarks that demonstrated this fact. And if you'll be using your PC for things other than just gaming, then the 5800X 3D really loses its appeal, as you can now easily find a 12-core Ryzen 5900X for 400 bucks or go with the regular 5800X non-3D, which outperforms the new CPU thanks to higher clock speeds and the ability to overclock. Or you could go for the 5700X, which is even cheaper, or an Intel 12700K, of course. Now, it is somewhat telling that AMD lifted the review embargo a week before these CPUs actually go up for sale on 420 Dude 420. It does mean that they were confident in the expected performance. But all that said, the 5800X 3D is a nice last hurrah for the AM4 platform that has presided over a remarkable shift in AMD's prospects and prosperity, and there is a notable uplift over the 5800X, particularly with gaming, simply with the addition of the 3D vCache technology, which bodes well for future implementations and the launch of AM5 later in 2022. It's a good year to be a PC enthusiast thus far, and hopefully that trend continues. One trend that I would like to see continue is more competition, and let's be honest, we're waiting for Intel on that front in more ways than one. Discrete desktop GPUs would be nice, sure, but we discussed the disappointing ARC developments after their laptop GPUs paper launched last week. So let's instead talk about the high-end desktop, a consumer PC category that Intel themselves created back in the late 2000s and then seemed to just abandon after AMD surprise launched their OG Threadripper CPUs back in August 2017. 
2017. Intel had a hard enough time answering AMD's mainstream Ryzen launches in the years following, while over in high-end desktop land, they sort of had a Threadripper alternative with their Xeon W3175X Skylake X CPU and LGA3647 motherboards, but those topped out at 28 cores, while AMD quickly ramped from 16 to 32 to 64 cores thanks to their Ryzen chiplet-based design. That made the six grand or so that you'd have to spend on a Skylake X CPU and motherboard not so appealing, even for the most enthusiastic of home PC enthusiasts. But now, thanks to info discovered in the IDA64 version 6.60.5944 patch notes, we have rumblings that Intel might be finally striking back in the HEDT space, and their weapon of choice has a name, Alder Lake X which I guess was pretty predictable given that all Intel high-end naming schemes tend to just add an X to the end of the name of the mainstream platform. Unfortunately, that's about all we know. Preliminary support for Intel Alder Lake X CPU is what the patch notes say. They didn't even make it plural, so maybe there's not even more than one, but that leaves us to speculate on whether the new CPU or CPUs will get their own socket, or if they'll be compatible with a consumer-focused variant of the Sapphire Rapids Xeon platform for servers and data centers. But for that niche crowd of power users, who love the added performance that high-end desktop solutions have provided in the past without having to pay enterprise prices, this does sound like good news. And maybe it will even convince AMD to launch non-pro Threadripper 5000 Chagall series CPUs that have actual retail prices, instead of listing for the tech equivalent of high-end seafood market prices at a snooty restaurant. If you have to ask how much it costs, you probably can't afford it. Speaking of affordable hardware, I like AMD's B550 series mother boards. There are solid offerings for $120 to $140 that support overclocking and just about all the useful features you need for a gaming PC. So this leak made me glad. A Ryzen 7000 series Zen 4 CPU on the next gen AM5 platform apparently slotted into an MSI MAG or MAG B650 motherboard. Now the leak itself is just a cropped photo of what appears to be a BIOS screen readout from Twitter leaker at 9550 Pro, so grain of salt and all. But if true, we can deduce a few things from the information provided. First, will B650 chipset boards be available at launch? For AM4, AMD launched flagship X570 chipset boards alongside Ryzen 3000 series CPUs in summer 2019, but then didn't launch B550 for another year until summer 2020. Budget B650 options earlier in the AM5 release cycle would definitely be appreciated. Many noted the V-Core displayed for the presumed Zen 4 CPU as well, which seemed to be a bit high at 1.532 volts. This could be an overclock, an early sample that lacks tuning, a spot reading during a voltage spike, or just just erroneous reporting by an engineering sample motherboard still in development, so for my part, I'm not reading into it too much. Normal voltage ranges can vary significantly from generation to generation, so it's far too early for hot takes on presumed Zen 4 thermal performance or power consumption. What is worth paying attention to is information directly from the mouths of AMD representatives. And during a Tuesday Meet the Experts webinar, we heard from Joseph Tao, AMD's memory enabling manager, who talked about DDR5 memory overclocking on the AM5 platform, codenamed Raphael, saying, we are really gonna try to make a big splash with overclocking, and I'll just kind of leave it there. But speeds that you maybe thought couldn't be possible may be possible with this overclocking spec. And that's an interesting prospect. I guess if we're abandoning the laws of physics though, personally, I'd like to overclock my DDR5 memory to a resonant frequency that causes cascading atomic fission reactions until all matter in the universe is converted to pure energy. But Joseph is likely referring to AMD's new RAMP settings, RAMP or Ryzen Accelerated Memory Profiles, another attempt by AMD to supplant Intel's ubiquitous XMP acronym. XMP has an X that stands for extreme though, and we all know that acronyms with X's sound cooler. So AMD will be fighting an uphill battle there. Good thing they're bringing a ramp. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of things that are ramping up, how about those GPU stock levels? In an unprecedented move not seen since the heady days of fall 2020, NVIDIA is actively promoting the fact that they manufacture and sell gaming graphics cards with Thursday's launch of their restocked and reloaded campaign. GeForce RTX 30 series graphics cards are now available, claims NVIDIA with an implied for real this time though. Sorry about the couple of years there where we were probably selling pallets of marked up cards 
funds in bulk to crypto mining operations instead of to consumer retail outlets. Uh, but you know, mining profitability has kind of tanked recently, so those deals dried up. And now we're back, ready to sell to you, PC gamers, our true customers who we are unfailingly loyal towards unless market conditions dictate that we might more profitably sell our wares elsewhere. Time to shop. Yes, while the bitter taste of the GPU shortage will likely linger in our collective mouth holes for many years to come, at least now there are RTX 3060s for less than 400 bucks. Really, they're all gone? <laughs> of course, of course they are. 3060 Ti's for less than 500 bucks. Less than 400 bucks too, actually, but it looks like those sold out. Even sub $1,000 RTX 3080s. And you might be like, but Paul, those are still marked up over their promised MSRP, to which I say, remember your conditioning, my friends. It took a lot of coordinated effort to anchor those inflated GPU prices at absurdly high levels in the past one to two years. And you wanna just toss all that work out the window because you're still convinced that MSRP is somehow a fair selling price as suggested by the manufacturer? How dare you? Speaking of dares, I once dared a friend to give me an atomic wedgie, but he didn't know I was wearing my tech briefs, so he died instantly. Sort of like how I died inside of it when I heard this news on Thursday. The Ethereum merge, which will move the cryptocurrency from proof of work to proof of stake, has been delayed. Again, somewhat, sort of, officially, according to lead developer Tim Bako, who tweeted on Tuesday that it won't be June as many had hoped. Responses on one hand are predictable. Doom and gloomers and GPU mining advocates fell back on their tired claims that the merge will never happen because it has always been and will always be six months away in perpetuity. Never mind that just a week ago, the time span from April to June was actually two months. Counting is hard for some people. The more level-headed approach would be to note that Tim and others are still targeting Q3 or Q4 2022, according to the updated Ethereum merge landing page and ongoing progress with the Kiln proof-of-stake testnet has been progressing much better than expected, according to developers. The eventual move to proof-of-stake will kill off GPU Ethereum mining completely, and will likely see the secondary GPU market in particular get very competitive leading up to that as mining operations sell off their hardware. I've done my best to acknowledge some of the potential benefits of cryptocurrency in my public discussions on the subject, but my opinion on NFTs has remained unchanged. They simply suck, and those who disagree are more than likely NFT buyers who desperately want the handful of lines of blockchain code they paid too much money for to go up in value someday. Sure, there are plenty of NFT scams out there, but legit NFTs, especially high profile ones like former Twitter CEO Jack Dorsey's first tweet, are sure to go up in value over time, right? So thought crypto entrepreneur Sina Estavi, who purchased Jack's tweet NFT for 1,630 Ether, or about $2.9 million in March 2021. He attempted to resell the NFT last week in an OpenSea auction for $48 million, a cool 1,650% profit, half of which would be donated to charity, of course, except for one small problem. He only received seven total offers for the glorified URL he was shucking, topping out at 0.09 ETH, or about $280. And you know, it's been suggested to me in the past that headline-grabbing NFT transactions with sale prices in the millions of dollars are likely fraudulent with NFT sellers using anonymous wallets to sell to themselves to drive up the perceived value. And yeah, that's probably exactly what this was originally too. Speaking of likely crypto fraud, perhaps the most transparent example of insider trading yet took place on Wednesday when popular cryptocurrency exchange Coinbase published a blog post with a list of altcoins they were considering listing. And since perceived legitimacy is quite literally all it takes to conjure up increased value in the wild west that is Web 3.0 these days, all of those coins jumped in price thanks to the nod in the Coinbase blog. But since blockchain transactions are public, it didn't take long before Jordan Fish AKA Kobe on Twitter, realized that, hey, a wallet bought up $400,000 worth of those coins, specifically six of the 50 listed in the blog, in what was either a miraculous coincidence or just the latest glaring example of how easily those in positions of influence can get away with crypto shadiness. The transaction closed just three minutes before the blog went live, in fact, prompting countless fans of decentralized, unregulatable internet money to ask why the SEC hasn't done anything to stop this. Speaking of modern day atrocities, who out there picked up a 12th gen Intel Alder Lake desktop CPU? There 
Pretty nice, yes, but beware, for they carry a terrible curse. It turns out that the longer rectangular shape of Alder Lake CPUs, combined with the pressure points of the LGA1700 retention bracket, can cause the CPU to bend, warp, or bow, three words that mean essentially the same thing. This can reduce contact between the CPU cooler and IHS, causing temps to gradually get hotter and hotter. Intel has finally commented on the issue in response to a Tom's hardware inquiry, essentially acknowledging that it can happen, but downplaying its effect on performance. They also advise against modding to fix it, which can void your warranty, although no one truly knows how Intel divines the host of unspeakable mounting methods that end users might use with their CPU. CPUs. It's a good thing to be aware of, though, if you're running an LGA1700 CPU, and we'll have to wait and see if the issue becomes more widespread or if Intel makes any changes to the socket when 13th gen launches later this year. This one might have slipped by you last weekend. It's AMD's Epic 7004 Genoa processor, and it was pictured having no fewer than 12 Zen 4 chiplets, each with eight cores for 96 cores and 192 threads in the full fat configuration. Pictures of the SP5 or LGA6096 socket came out too, and my goodness, uh, but that is a very large processor. 12 channel DDR5 memory support and PCIe Gen 5 as well, with an expected launch by the end of this year. Computex plans were touch and go this year, and while I and many tech reviewer friends I've spoken to have decided to opt out since there's a 10 day quarantine required before you can go about your business in Taiwan, it does appear that the trade show will be taking place with a hybrid format. Make no mistake, if you're into PC hardware, there is no better event to follow than Computex. It's even more more focused on the subject than CES, but much as I'd like to make the trip, it sounds like I'll need to hold off until 2023 to visit Taipei in person again. For this year, you can still expect some announcements when the in-person show takes place from May 24th to 27th, and there will also be an online event called Digital Go from May 24th to June 6th. Lastly, we have more Steam Deck shenanigans, this time from YouTuber ETA Prime, who used the PCIe lanes from the Steam Deck's M.2 slot to wire up an RX 6900 XT discrete desktop GPU. This works with an AMD GPU, apparently, but not NVIDIA, and while the M.2 slot's by 4 connection and the APU's performance limited the 6900 XT pretty significantly, it still hit nearly 27,000 points in 3D Mark Fire Strike and over 15,000 in Time Spy, a significant boost over the built-in GPU. But if this all sounds pretty familiar, it's probably because Brett from UFD Tech did the same thing back at the end of March. Although he paired up more reasonable mid-range cards like the 6600 XT instead of the flagship 6900 XT. The Steam Deck continues to win over PC gamers thanks to silly stuff like this though, and I'll be honest, I never ordered one, but I kinda wish I did. I did get a reservation in a couple months back, but I'm probably so far back in the queue that I won't even be selected until Steam Deck 2 is ready to come out, or maybe by Christmas. I feel like I should make one more joke here, but I ran out of time, so I'll pause so you can insert your own. Uh, a sensible chuckle. So there you have it guys, tech news for the week, and if you liked it, I casually suggest that you click that like button. Your feedback is always welcome too, so please feel free to leave me a comment down below. While you're down there, all the articles I talked about today are linked in the video's description, and if you're interested, you can also check out my store at paulshardware.net for high quality merchandise like t-shirts, hoodies, beer sets, and more. And subscribing to my channel is always a good idea too. Thanks again everyone, and we'll see you next week.